Hello. Good uh, Good afternoon. This is uh, Aaron Eads in Peoria, still, um, with more with more notes that I'm going to read to you, if you really want to hear them. Um, you know, sometimes you sometimes you walk out of court not believing what you just heard. Um, that's happened a lot with this case, I think. But, uh, but I have it here in my notes and I don't think that I was lying to myself at the time. So we're just gonna, we're gonna go with it for now. Um, we went into detail. Today was day seven of the trial. At the rate that they're going, I'm expecting that they will rest their cases by tomorrow. And then the closing arguments are going to be on Monday. Um, I'm going to wait for some more people to hop on here before, before I start reading the notes. Usually we get a, we get a couple hundred here. Um, but I was, I was just saying, sometimes you just, you walk out of court, not believing what you just heard. And this is not the first time this has happened in this case. There's been a lot of, oh my God moments, um, and things like that. And this is no, this is no exception to that. Uh, so today began, uh, his girlfriend, ex-girlfriend at this point, Tara Bullis, uh, had, was on the stand. She took the stand yesterday afternoon for the first time, kind of describing some of the conversations that we that she had with Christensen that she recorded with the FBI. Um, <clears throat> today, we actually got to the walk, um, which is the walk for Zhang on June 29th, 2017. The walk and concert for her, that is. Um, and, and so we actually got to that recording and we're going to talk about how she, how she did that or how she says she did that, what she talked about in court this morning. Um, so she testifies, Christian did started to be stressed out about news reports about the investigation. She called the car or he called the car a false lead. Um, I reported some of that last week cause we, today we heard a lot of the clips that we heard last week as well. Um, complained that the FBI still had his shoes and he suggested that there was a real culprit out there. Um, he, he told his girlfriend, quote, I'm sure in the back of their minds they're still hoping it's me because that's easy for them. And he called it political, uh, though his girlfriend didn't know what he meant by political exactly. Um, he also says that on the morning of June 9th, because I guess Tara was asking him if he was drunk, and he says that he only had two shots on June 9th. And remember, we saw surveillance video of him that morning buying an entire handle of Admiral Nelson's rum. Um... He said he only had two shots, but he wished that in hindsight he would have been drunk. Quote, because you know that I wouldn't have, uh, yeah. That's the quote. He doesn't actually say what he wouldn't have done if he was drunk. Um, but I mean, we can, we can kind of guess at this point. Um, he also, he also says they didn't find Jack in his apartment. He said there's nothing to find there after the agents searched his apartment. Um, and he called himself the scapegoat for the entire thing. And again, again, this is before we get to the walk. We're going to get to the walk in a minute. These are just conversations that they had uh, in the middle of June that she recorded for him. Um, Bullis at this point is trying to get as much information as she can. So she's trying to keep these conversations going. She says she doesn't want to have these conversations with him. She doesn't want to talk about this stuff, but, um, but she figures she has to just to get information out of him. So she suggests that it would be okay that he can talk to her. You know, he can open up to her in that she's not going to be freaked out by any of the details because, and she suggests to him that she has Stockholm syndrome. Um, trying to encourage him to talk and then and he also he also mentions that he thinks the only reason why this case is getting so much publicity is because he says quote the only reason this ever got any attention is because like specific details like that he's referring to the fact that Zhang had an appointment she was trying to go to that she missed she had a place to be there were details in it that he says caused it to get publicity. That if she hadn't have been on her way somewhere, um, she didn't have a place where she was before and after, nobody would have ever paid attention to this. Um, let's see. So, so they're talking about... Um, and I can't even read my own handwriting. I apologize, guys. I'm, I'm trying to 
trying to figure out what I wrote here. Um, so they start talking about serial killers at this point. Um, they, he has an interest in them. We've already established that. Uh, he says that, and she says his eyes got wider. He started talking faster when they started, when they started this conversation. He said that there were other serial killers in the past. I think he mentioned John Wayne Gacy saying that if they would kill like, um, prostitutes at truck stops, he said, nobody cares if those kinds of people go missing. They just happen to care in the case of, of Zhang. Um, so there's another conversation that's really ironic, um, that he has with Bullis and she's recording this. He says, quote, I'm still kind of paranoid. They're listening to me. Like, really? Um, you don't say, and in, in, in court, Bola said she felt incredibly nervous when she said that because that's exactly what was happening. Um, and then, and then she, they just keep talking about, she's like, well, you can tell me what's on your mind and everything. And they're talking about these crimes and Christensen says, quote, the unfortunate thing about all of this is that there's one way, the number one way people get caught with any crime. And he says that's by telling somebody that they did it. How, how ironic is that, knowing what is about to uh, transpire here? Uh, and there's another irony in here, too, that we're going to see. Um, she says, he says that if hypothetically he did anything, he can't tell his girlfriend anything because she would have information and that could send the FBI to her door. And then if she lied, it would be a felony. He said, quote, I care about you too much to ever try and put you in that kind of situation. Um and says that, suggested that she could become an accomplice if that happens. So the recording continues after we take a brief recess, um, says that, she says, well, what if, what if she did something? What if I did something? And Christensen just said, she's like, would you, would you tell, would you tell on me if I, if I did something like that and I'm telling you about it? Christensen says, quote, well, yeah, I would probably tell because I don't want to go to jail for 30 years. Direct quote. Um, Assistant United States Attorney Nelson has been questioning Bullis throughout this. The AUSA asks, what was she thinking? She says, I was terrified. She was terrified about all this. Um, so now we're getting to the walk. The walk in concert for Zhang on June 29th of 2017. Christensen texts her saying to meet at her place so the two could take a bus to Zhang's walk. Um, Bullis instead suggests that they just meet at Craner. Um, and we see some of their text messages. Christian says, says, quote, I'm going to this no matter what. I'd love it if you were there with me. And she's kind of like, man, I don't know if I want to go. And he says, quote, the Dom in me says you do what I want. And that's because they're in a dominant submissive relationship. Um, and then Bullis texted him later, you know, asking him why you wanted to go. She says, have you not seen enough of the posters in the news articles? Um, but she ends up agreeing to go anyway. So she says she goes to the FBI office to get the recording devices back because she kept dropping them off there so they could extract the recordings. So she goes to the FBI office, gets those, goes back home, and then takes a bus to Cranor Center. Now, on her way there, she says she takes alternative bus routes um, just to make sure that she doesn't run into him on the bus system. She doesn't want to run into him at this point. So the court shows... Pictures are shown in court of the two of them sitting on the steps at Craner. They meet on the steps there. Um, Bulla says they sat down and Christensen took her... He had a backpack. He reaches into the backpack and he takes out her collar. Um, I guess she had, a, she had a collar that she wore because, again, they're in a BDSM relationship and she's the submissive. And um, remember that he called her my kitten frequently. So that's why he takes the collar out. And she says, no, I don't want to wear that. I don't think it would be appropriate for this event because it's kind of somber. He doesn't make her wear it. Um, she says throughout this, he seemed to be smiling a little too much for the nature of the event. Um, he had a water bottle filled with some alcohol in it. She said it was maybe a fifth full, maybe four inches of alcohol. Um, he said whenever she says, he said whenever he took a drink, she would he would make her take a drink. So I take a drink, you take a drink. That's what he kind of established for, for all of that. When he said, they're here for me, she went 
into the bathroom to turn on the recording device because she's like, oh crap, I gotta be recording this. Um, so he added some water to the bottle. I don't know if that's relevant, but but he did. So then they start playing more audio clips to the to the court here. Um, they talk about the two of them talk about getting a, a pamphlet that somebody was handing out of of the event that night. They called it a souvenir. Uh, and at one point, he takes her hand. And this is her testimony. This is according to her. I'm, I'm not saying that this happened. I'm saying this is what she says happened, to be clear here. He takes her hand and traces the number 13 into her palm. Um, so now he's starting to tell her what is up. And uh, she says at that point, quote, I felt like I was being studied and observed. So eventually she went, the concert's about to begin. She says she's concerned about the recording device's battery life. So she goes back to the bathroom to turn it off. Um, because she didn't, she figured, well, the concert's going on. You're not going to be able to hear anything anyway. I got to save the battery for later because he's starting to tell me stuff. So she turns it off and then she emails the FBI. Um, she then deletes those emails immediately before she walks back out. It's a good thing she did. Here's the next thing that's ironic about it. She says that when she met back up with Brent, he took her phone, looked through her texts and phone calls. He looked through her phone. So had she not deleted those emails to the FBI, he would have, he probably would have found out. Um, at this point, and again, the recording device is not on. This is her testimony. He says that she take, he take, sorry. She says, Tara Bullis says, Brent Christensen takes out her phone, pulls up the notepad device on it and writes four lines on it, deleting each one as he writes it. And the lines were this quote, it was me. She was number 13. She's gone forever. Um, he seemed kind of nervous, she said, as she was telling him this. So they go to the concert. She says while they're at the concert, he's pointing out a woman who's standing near them um, and explaining how she could be an ideal victim. And then here's what said she, she said was really eerie, and she demonstrated this for the court today. At the end of the concert, people, people applauded, and it caught her off guard how he applauded. And I'm going to set down the phone for a second so I can kind of explain to you how that worked. I'm going to set it right in the steering wheel there. So she said that normally, and this is, she's on the witness stand and she's demonstrating this. She says people in, would applaud like that, right? You're clapping for a concert that just got done. That's what you would do. She says that his claps were long, slow, staccato. So she says he was clapping like this. And um, she, she showed that, that's, she demonstrated that in court today. Um, so that's. The only reason I was able to replicate that. Um, so at that point, once the concert's over, she goes back to the bathroom, turns the recording device back on again, texts one of her housemates um, saying, hey, send me a text message and tell me that he can't come over tonight because at this point she's afraid of him. She doesn't want him in the house. So she says, I contacted one of my roommates to keep him out or make sure he stays out. So... Um, so that he doesn't have to come inside. Hang on a second. I'm just going to check the time real quick. Okay, we got time. Um, then Christensen starts to describe how uh, Zhang fought. And you've heard or seen this before. You've, you've probably, guess, I'm just going to assume that you've seen some of the stuff that he, uh, that he said on this recording. Says that he's living a double life. Um, that Zhang's the only one who's produced evidence leading back to him. Um, and again, Bullis says that he did not appear to be intoxicated throughout this. We're almost to the end of all this here. Um, when Christensen described how he cut Zhang's head off, she said he was laughing about it. And he also complained about how long it took for her to die, saying that he didn't believe almost that she was dead when he cut her head off. Saying, quote, no, uh-uh, none of that effing zombie stuff. He didn't say stuff, but you know, you know what I mean? And he was laughing when he said that. Um, he describes doing stuff to her sexually, um, but that he got bored with it. And at this point he kind of abruptly changes the conversation, says he's hungry, that he wanted to eat. And he's just switching back and forth between topics. Like it's nothing, uh, suggests going to pot bellies. Um, so Bullis 
says, quote, is 13 really a big number? And he says, quote, it's bigger than Jeffrey Dahmer, bigger than John Wayne Gacy. I have caught the nation's attention, apparently. And again, you've heard snippets of this conversation before. Um, Bulla says that you could hear her. Uh, Nelson asked her, hey, what's that thumping sound? Um, she said, that's my heartbeat in the clip. Um, that was her, her testimony today. Uh, Christensen reiterated that Zhang is gone forever. He said, quote, I can do this within hours. It's a weird thing to be really good at, but it's true. All right, we're on the last page now. Thanks for bearing with us, everybody. Um, Bullis describes the way that he's describing all this as clinical. That's the word that she used today. Uh, so after that, Bullis says she went home and cried, called the FBI, eventually turned over her recordings to Special Agent Andrew Huckstadt, who has testified before. Um, she says that, you know, Brent was arrested the next day on June 30th. He tried to call her numerous times. She looked at her phone screen. All it was was calls from him from jail. Um, and Michelle also tried to get in contact with her several times as well. She also made the point of mentioning she and Christensen were not sexually active since Zhang went missing, since June 9th. Um, cause I'm sure somebody was probably wondering about that. Um, that he was very concentrated on the investigation and did most of the talking throughout that time. She says the publicity deeply affected her. She was unable to work in a public environment after that. She sought mental health treatment. The FBI gave her financial help. They reimbursed her seven or eight thousand uh, dollars. And at the very end here, um, Assistant United States Attorney James Nelson asked her, "How does it feel to be testifying against him today?" She said, "Quote terrifying." He said, "So why are you doing it?" She says, "Because it's necessary." And with that, the court took their lunch break. When we come back, the defense is going to cross-examine her. I don't know what exactly they're going to say, but I'm imagining it's going to be over the issue of whether or not Christensen is drunk. They have consistently tried to maintain that he has an alcohol problem um, to try to discredit some of the things he's saying. Number, The biggest thing is that he had 12 other victims. That's the defense's biggest point of contention. or it ha It's been one of the biggest. I don't know if it's fair to say it is the number one thing. Um, but the FBI has admitted they don't have evidence tying him to 12 other people. So I'm, I'm guessing that that's what they're going to be questioning her about. Uh, at some point, the defense is supposed to make their case coming up. I thought they would get to that today, but now I'm not so sure. Um, his ex-wife is going to testify as a witness for the defense. And then the defense says they're going to briefly call up one or two of the FBI agents again to clarify a couple points. Um, but they say that should be pretty quick. So that's where we are at. Um, the reporter's notebook post on WCIA.com, I've thrown as much as I could on that. It's still somewhere in the middle of uh, yesterday that I had to that I had to stop um, just because I have to, you know, I've, I have to sleep at some point and get ready for TV and everything else. But I will update that later. But if you that's the most extensive document on the trial. Um, other than that, uh, watch at 5 and 6 tonight for the next update. Usually I haven't had time to hop back on Facebook Live between when court gets out and when we have to go go live then. So I've got to prepare scripts for on air. So we will, we will see you back at 5 and 6. Thanks for watching, everyone.